Welcome to the Texas A&M School of Law's webinar, Moving Forward Post-Insurrection. Today's webinar will kick off the Spring 2021 uh, TAMU Law Answers Conversations in Law and Social Justice webinar series. And we have a number of upcoming webinars. Two weeks from now, we have one on mental health justice. Um, in March, we will do one on leadership and mentoring the next generation of lawyer leaders followed by a, an update on the family separation issues related to immigrant youth. Um, we will then proceed with the two other webinars, one on training social justice lawyers and farm worker employment justice. All of our webinars are every other Thursday and they are at noon central time. You can register for these webinars at tamulawanswers.info Today's webinar is co-sponsored by Texas A&M School of Law and the Network for Justice, which is part of the American Bar, Bar Foundation's project, The Future of Latinos in the United States. And upcoming seminars are also going to, uh, webinars, sorry, are also sponsored by the American Bar Association's Commission on Hispanic Legal Rights and Responsibilities. I have the great pleasure today of introducing uh, some wonderful speakers that have um, agreed to be part of this very timely conversation. We have Professor Samir Ashar, who's our moderator. He's a clinical professor at the University of California, Irvine School of Law. We have Professor Luis Fraga, who is at the University of Notre Dame and is part of the Department of Political Science. We also have Associate Professor of History at Texas A&M, Felipe Hinojosa. And we have Professor Wilson, uh, Erica Wilson at the UNC School of Law who, uh, who is also joining us. Now, we don't go through a whole lot of bios uh, for these accomplished uh, guests. We have linked their bios and their information on the webinar. We're very excited to, to have them all involved. And as you will see um, in the conversation, their uh, experience and expertise is really um, gonna be the highlight of, of today's conversation. Um, some of the panelists are attorneys and they will be discussing legal issues and law generally, but nothing in this webinar should be considered as legal advice. Uh, if there's an issue where an attendee needs uh, legal assistance, they should consult with their own legal advisor to address their unique cir circumstances. One other thing before I hand it over to Professor Asher is uh, if you have any questions after the initial presentations, there will be a, a question and answer session Please type in your questions as they come up in the Zoom Q&A feature at any time, and the panelists will address the submitted questions as time allows. So with that, I'm going to uh, thank again the panelists for, for joining us, and I'm going to turn it over to Professor uh, Ashar so he can help us think about what, what have we learned you know, since the January 6th insurrection, and what, do, what, what lessons do we have in terms of uh, social justice causes and conversations? So thank you all. Thanks, Luz. Uh, really appreciate um, um, being a part of this panel. And um, it feels even more urgent. Uh, it, it already felt urgent, but in light of all of the new footage that's being released um, in Washington, DC over the last few days as a part of the impeachment case, just um, uh, over and over again brings home uh, the urgency of the question that's before us and um, what to do about the threat of white nationalism um, uh, with the, you know, the risk that it could um, tear our country apart. And so I'm so pleased to have um, perspectives from a uh, political scientist, historian, and legal scholar uh, to try to um, help um, inform the debate. Um, obviously, we're still processing. I mean, we're still all processing even just the last four years, let alone what happened on January 6th. Um, but um, I think uh, the panelists have um, sort of uh, uh, scholarly tools that they've used to analyze, uh, both in the past and the present. Um, and they can help us think um, in more careful, nuanced, and deeper ways about uh, the forces that we're facing. So I wanted to launch the conversation. I was going to ask um, Luis, uh, our political scientist, to kind of help launch uh, our conversation um, and ask you, Luis, how are the insurrectionists uh, part of a longer line of right-wing uh, movements in the United States going back uh, 
um, at least a couple of centuries. Um, and what are the continuities and discontinuities of this group of insurrectionists with past far right wing movements? Samir, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to Texas A&M Law for putting this together. Um, under the premise that looking back provides us a rich foundation for being able to move forward and think about what we might do, I thought I would start by simply suggesting that we understand what has happened more recently, the last four years, and of course, what happened on January 6th of this year, as part of a longer trend of a political and social movement, political and social movement that has its origins in reconstruction and especially post-reconstruction, that has its origins in efforts to try to deny access, opportunity, voting, influence, representation of African-American communities that had, because of the three Civil War amendments, become very, very effective participants in the American political process. Hundreds of thousands of those who were former slaves after the Civil War voted. Uh, hundreds were elected to public office. And all of that changed with the removal of military, uh, Union troops in 1877 and the resurgence of Southern identity and Southern resentment against the progress that had been made. If one then jumps, and this is a quick jump, but if one jumps it to then a second major development that I think helps us understand where we are today, which was the development of the John Birch Society in the 1950s, it had two primary premises. One, it had the premise of being very anti-communist and very suspicious of communism. McCarthyism comes to mind here. But it also had a very strong premise of promotion of states' rights that was consistent with a suspicion of federal government and its efforts to try to um, use its authority to push states to treat its citizens, especially African-Americans, more fairly. If one understands that John Birch Society, it was then manifested, I think, and the sentiments of the John Birch Society were very much manifested in the mid-1960s in the nomination of Barry Goldwater as a, if you will, extreme conservative from the West very important to understand how national these issues are. From the West in 1964, as a Republican candidate for president of the United States, he was of course not successful, but it, it showed how at least the Republican party as then constituted, as then constituted could put up a candidate who had views that some considered, many considered, even within the public Republican Party as extremely conservative and right wing. Move forward then to the evolution of, um, quickly, they move forward to the evolution of Richard Nixon's Southern strategy and the way in which the Republican Party decided that it could enhance its electoral gains by pushing white supporters of segregation white supporters of states' rights, white supporters of suspicions of greater national government power to support Republicans rather than Democrats precisely at the time when the federal government um, under the leadership of Lyndon Johnson and to some degree earlier President Kennedy, the extent to which the federal government had become not a completely active but a more active participant in trying to guarantee the rights of African-Americans and later other ethnic racial minorities. It then culminates in the nomination and election and eight years of governance of Ronald Reagan and the support he received. You remember that Ronald Reagan used to say the government was not the solution, government was the problem. That position, again, Ronald Reagan from California, a Westerner, a Western extreme, although by today's standards, some would call him, some would call him a moderate, I would not. I would say an extreme conservative as well, who in a sense legitimated that sentiment because of the level of office that he held and the positions that he took and the policy positions that he took as well. Now then move to the Tea Party. 
and the way in which the Tea Party and the evolution of the Tea Party was, was an attempt by some, again, within the Republican Party to present a more conservative and extreme conservative position. And I think it's fair to say that the positions of many of the uh, supporters of the, of the Tea Party and elected officials who gained their positions because of the way in which they embraced the Tea Party led to the type of expression of dissatisfaction with the electoral process, dissatisfaction with politics as it traditionally occurred. And that was part, a very significant part of what led to the election of Donald Trump. And I think his leadership position as head of the Republican Party and as president of the United States then led to the type of suspicion of government action and especially of any opposition that led to the sort of event that we saw on January 6th. And my point to conclude very quickly is that we have to understand that what happens in contemporary terms happens because of earlier efforts to try to legitimate these views, to legitimate these views that has very legitimate these views in American popular discourse that has very deep roots, very deep roots in American society. I wanted to zero in on one. Um, well, uh, you uh, date um, uh, the sort of historical analysis back to Reconstruction, which sounds just right, um, in at least in US history. Um, but the, um, the sort of dialectic or relationship between anti-Blackness in American law and governance and anti-immigrant fervor and, and in more recent in the last 50 years, that well, 30 to 50 years, kind of anti-Latinx uh, fervor, which finds its full expression in Trump's, you know, sort of ascent within the Republican Party. Um, just in the last four years, um, anti-immigrant uh, sentiment uh, and policy has been a core kind of a pillar of, uh, you know, the Trump um, administration. What's the relationship between anti-Blackness and anti-immigrant, anti-Latinx fervor? How does it mutate? How does it come to the surface and then go get submerged again? What, what are your thoughts on that? My, my, my thought is, I, at least to me, very clear. We have a long history of anti-immigrant fervor, just like we have a long history of anti-African-American sentiment. Goes back to the Alien and Sedition Acts of the late 1700s, goes back to the um, development of the Know Nothing Party in the, in the early 1830s, and which immigrant groups were the targets Starting in the 1930s, Latino immigrants or Mexican immigrants were a target of national policy through repatriation efforts. Under the Hoover and later Roosevelt administrations, it continued under a renewed effort in the Eisenhower administration in the 1950s with, this was the actual term used, the formal term used, Operation Wetback to try to repatriate many Mexicans and as happened, many Mexican Americans, perhaps not by design, some would say by design, to have that be part of how American national identity was enhanced. The way that I relate the two together is simply through an understanding that immigrants become part of how Americans, especially many white Americans understand the power of racial hierarchy and the power of racial privilege and the power of white resentment to mobilize forces. As well, it shows the way in which that sentiment is reflected in national policy. When we think of then what happens with Trump and under the, the direction and advice of his uh, primary advisor on these issues, Stephen Miller, what we see is that Latinos and Latino immigrants and Muslim immigrants and mm -hmm. other immigrants, immigrants mm -hmm. from Haiti, for example, mm -hmm. become explicit and Central America become explicit targets of exclusion. The term that I like to use, and I'll conclude with this point, a term that is used in some political science and sociological literature is that some immigrant groups, especially those of color, mm 
can always be considered perpetual foreigners, regardless of their formal citizenship status, regardless of how many generations they're in the United States, they can quickly become identified as not American or not American enough to be considered legitimate in the way that African-Americans throughout so much of their history in this country have been considered less than full citizens. Right. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Um, Felipe, um, you've just published uh, a new book called uh, Apostles of Change on the church takeovers by the young lords um, in four American cities in 1969 and 1970. Um, How do you understand specifically the role of religion in the social movements that have led to the insurrection on January 6th. What's, what's, how does religion fit in, um, in, in, in the sort of social movement ideation? Well, well let me just start out by saying that uh, religion is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. It fits in uh, like a glove in terms of thinking about everything that Luis has just described uh, in terms of that long history of uh, exclusion and white supremacy. Uh, you know, I think it's hard to, um, uh, especially as, as, as you just noted at the beginning uh, with the new videos that we are um, uh, watching uh, as the impeachment trial proceeds, that uh, this was in, in many uh, ways a Christian insurrection. This was a religious movement, uh, crosses being held up. Um, we see that these insurrectionists inside of the Senate chamber took a moment Uh, They were not fearful at all. They stopped. They took a moment uh, to pray. Uh, They removed their head coverings. You see the shaman removing uh, his head covering in one of the videos uh, to take time to pray. These are folks that have believed right from the beginning that God is on their side and that, um, uh, you know, the the kind of defense of these uh, American ideals, uh, according to them, are um, uh, supplanted, are defended, are undergirded by a very specific uh, theology uh, that the United States has really adhered to. And I think just to sort of think about it in this way is that when we talk about this insurrection, it's a question of nationalism, it's a question of white supremacy, and it's a question of uh, white Christianity. Um, You know, the American Enterprise Institute uh, just came out with their findings on how just how divided the country was. And I was listening to the report just this morning that found that three in five white evangelicals still believe that Biden was voted in, uh, uh, that it was an illegitimate election. Um, No religious group, uh, more so than white evangelicals, uh, takes as much pride in being American as they do. Uh, That white evangelicals are much, much more likely to believe in conspiracy theories, in QAnon, and all of this sort of madness that has emerged on on social media, and that white evangelicals, more so than any other religious group, are actually fearful of a Biden administration, uh, scared in terms of what uh, might come, and even trying moving, go, going to the extreme of, um, you know, their sense of losing the American way and going to the extreme of having to enact violence in order to defend, uh, you know, in order to defend that. That's very very sort of, um, uh, it, it ties into the history of white Christianity in this country in the 1920s that has that long history as Luis was mentioning. In the 1920s, uh, KKK members were very much tied with the church. They would go in and give announcements and give testimonies and give uh, and invite, uh, you know, uh, parishioners out to Klan rallies. Uh, you know, in Houston in the 1960s, as Houston was experiencing suburban growth and development, inner city white churches were dealing with the question of leaving the city and moving to the suburbs and the question of integration and white pastors actually standing at the doors of the church prohibiting uh, African-Americans from coming in or even becoming members of these churches. So this is, a you know, it, it, it's sort of, um, it, religion is everywhere and yet it's almost ignored in these, in sometimes in these conversations, it's very rare to sort of see the, as much as these religious symbols were up everywhere, that um, you know, for whatever reason, um, it's it's not put together in that particular way. I guess it's just assumed, like it's in the water, and we don't <laughs> right. like think about um, separating it out. Um, so, in your in, in your book, in your scholarly work, you talk about the confrontations of left social movements with the church to try to force the church to take positions that would be favorable to 
people who were its constituents. Um, do you see anything analogous happening um, in the current moment between left social movements um, and the church? Is there a viable religious left um, that is in, you know, in, in, in part an answer to uh, what you just laid out? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, you know, I don't buy into the arguments that somehow there was a decline of the religious left in the 1970s or in that era of retrenchment uh, in the years after the civil rights movement. Um, people of faith uh, have been active at the grassroots level. And I think part of the problem has been that the religious left is often misconstrued, often misidentified. And it's almost a similar problem in the sense that when we do see these sort of movements emerge, um, that uh, these religious and progressive movements emerge, um, that oftentimes we're not talking enough about how uh, faith and religion are influencing these progressive movements for justice in, 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 in radically, obviously radically, radically uh, different ways. Um, there is a viable movement. Uh, you look at uh, uh, the Reverend William Barber uh, and, and the resurgence of the Poor People's Campaign, uh, Sister Nancy Pimentel in South Texas in terms of looking and working with uh, families that have been separated uh, on the border. Um, it's, it's it, you know, the problem is that there's, um, instead of thinking about a religious left as sort of a national movement, it really has historically been a very sort of grassroots movement. And that's, that's a benefit. And that's also a curse in terms of understanding and how we see uh, the religious left. What I write about in 1969 are barrio kids, uh, activists, radicals that were imagining a new a society that grew up many times in Catholic and Protestant and Pentecostal homes um, and were going to the church to find what society was not offering. Uh, you know, 1969 was a turbulent year. Nixon is, is moving back on Johnson's war on poverty. He's going to uh, strip the dollars that are going to those federal programs and communities are legitimated concerned in terms of what will happen and what resources were uh, would be offered mm -hmm. and these these occupiers these activists these radicals these dreamers mm -hmm. go into these churches and begin to establish health clinics mm -hmm. uh, food pantries um, you know they're they're reading poetry out loud they're doing educational classes mm -hmm. uh, they're allowing welfare organizations to come in and strategize in terms of what's going to be the agenda for the 1970s um, and if, if anything, the religious left, the kinds of hope that it offers us is, is looking at how we can be sort of pragmatic in terms of what we're going to need in the coming years to push back against this type of, um, you know, religious extremism, white supremacy that has become, I hesitate to even say extremist because it has become mainstream, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, um, Felipe. I wanted, Eric, I wanted to bring you into the conversation. Um, you've authored a forthcoming article in Harvard Law Review entitled Monopolizing Whiteness about the value of all white schools and the inadequacy of equal protection theory in eroding um, white privilege. So, so let's talk squarely about whiteness. What's, what's the, the basis of the seeming siege mentality that the insurrectionists showed and demonstrated? How has whiteness been challenged in the last decade? And why do we see now this violent reaction by white nationalists? Yeah, thank you for that. Because I think uh, in order to understand any of this, we have to start uh, with the construction of whiteness. So I'm going to share my screen because I want to share a couple of photos that I think will help us to um, better navigate this conversation. Okay, um, can you all see the slides? Yes. Okay, um, so the first thing to note, I would say, is that um, in order to understand the siege mentality, we have to understand- We can see your presenter's view, if that, is that what you wanna share or do you wanna share just- I, Okay, now, how about now? That works, yes. yes. Okay. Um, but the first thing that we uh, have to understand is that the siege mentality is very much rooted in white supremacy. And so we throw around the term white supremacy a lot. Uh, and I think the layperson, when they hear white supremacy, they think of people on sheets, uh, burning crosses, et cetera. Uh, and certainly that's a form of white supremacy. And we saw some of that out there uh, with the insurrectionists. But I want to give us a more precise definition of white supremacy because I think that 
is that this definition is at the root of all that we're seeing. And that definition is a political, economic, and cultural system in which whites overwhelmingly control power and material resources, and in which white dominance and non-white subordination exist across an array of institutions and social settings. So it's this idea uh, that whiteness uh, is at the top of a, a racial hierarchy, so to speak. And so looking at this from a, a law professor perspective, I always say that the law orders um, and structures our societal norms, uh, expectations, and property rights. Um, and so that siege mentality, I think, is a function of a twofold reality. The first is that the law orders and structures uh, societal norms, uh, expectations, and property rights uh, that are grounded in this notion of white supremacy. Uh, so for much of the country's history, uh, as Luis has talked about, the law operated to essentially codify white supremacy in all of our institutions. It did so in ways that categorized, um, that gave uh, whites both material and symbolic expectations of superiority. Uh, and so what did that look like? It started, I think you have to go back even further. Uh, the construction of whiteness actually started with the uh, laws that made uh, Africans enslaved, right? We actually had laws that said, if you are raced as a black or African, you're enslaved. If you are raced as white, you are free. Uh, and so it, th that's where we see the first initial valuation of whiteness. Uh, even after the end of enslavement, uh, that uh, the law continued to operate in that manner, uh, limiting black uh, participation in American life, uh, creating Jim Crow laws, et cetera. Uh, it also did so through its immigration laws, right? Our first Immigration and Nationalization Act of 1790 uh, by law, uh, by the text of the law, limited citizenship to free whites. Um, subsequent immigration laws continue to uh, prefer uh, white people. The 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, the Immigration Naturalization Act of 1924, which had racialized quotas. Uh, and so the combination of all of these things, the race conscious immigration laws, the um, construction of whiteness uh, in order to justify enslavement of Africans, help to entrench a, a sense of white supremacy and superiority. It also, most importantly, I think, fed into notions uh, uh, of whites that, uh, that the only true American is white uh, and that the all others, uh, no matter uh, how you got here, are, are not real Amer Americans. So in the last four decades, I will say, uh, and I put up the sign, the no dogs, uh, Negroes and Mexicans, because this was not that far ago. Uh, I pulled this uh, slide, and this was a sign that was up uh, in the 1940s. Uh, and to give you some perspective on that, uh, these are signs that my mother saw. My mother growing up in Jim Crow, Arkansas, my father growing up in Jim Crow, Louisiana. This was a way of life for them. And so in the last four decades, I would say, the white uh, expectations have been uh, upset in terms of what that hierarchy is going to look like. Uh, a lot of this, uh, what we saw at the Capitol stemmed from uh, feelings about the election of the first uh, non-white president uh, and Barack Obama, right? Uh, this uh, was a catalyst for the Tea Party um, and a lot of the things that followed. Um, and so what we saw in terms of the mentality of the uh, insurrectionists was this reclaiming what they felt like they were entitled to have uh, to to grapple for a resetting of uh, the, the way our laws are going to look. Uh, Trump definitely had a different agenda and they wanted to continue that agenda because they thought building a wall why it would get us back to an all white um, scenario where there are not as many folks of color. Uh, this idea of even questioning Obama's uh, true uh, citizenship, because again, only uh, whites can be true Americans. And so the last two slides I'll show um, just this symbolic, uh, this picture was particularly symbolic for me in terms of understanding the siege mentality, because here we have the Confederate flag uh, that never breached the Capitol during the Civil War actually being flown uh, proudly in the Capitol by the insurrectionists. Um, and then we also have another uh, point that I think is pretty prescient is that at some point 
uh, the insurrectionists were actually removing the American flag in order to put up the Trump flag, this idea of a white savior who's going to return them to a pre-time uh, uh, of whiteness, right? And all of this, I think, is rooted in the backlash. Uh, critical race theorists, we call it reform retrenchment, right? We had reforms that integrated people of color born to the American system, uh, the retrenchment uh, was, uh, retrenchment always follows that. In this case, the retrenchment was the election uh, of Trump after the election of uh, President Obama uh, and all of the uh, very myopic uh, policies that followed. Can I, can I ask you, Erica, um, if we, if we, if we take the critical race theory sort of um, framework of, of um, reform and retrenchment, um, I, what happens after retrenchment, uh, or is there no after? Uh, is it, it and and how long does retrenchment last, and and uh, and how bad does it get? Um, do you have thoughts on that, particularly with this new administration that's now in office? Um, you know, uh, is the Biden administration a part of the retrenchment or a part of lukewarm reform, right? That will lead to even further uh, backlash and siege mentality. Well, I would say it's important to understand that the retrenchment, uh, the reform retrenchment theory suggests that racial progress is not linear, uh, that we're not going to keep getting going up and getting better, but that we're going to have peaks and valleys uh, and that the valleys will all, always dip us back to the baseline of white supremacy. So the retrenchment lasts as long as it needs to last to get us back to an acceptable baseline of white supremacy. Uh, and so from that perspective, I do think with the Biden administration, we'll see some peaks of what looked like reform, but we also have to be very careful uh, because the thing about reform retrenchment is that when you get the retrenchment, uh, it takes you so far back that if you come up just a little bit, you think that's reform. Um, so you never get to a place uh, of linear progression, but continued dips, ups and downs. So one of the things that we must be particularly uh, vigilant uh, about with the Biden administration is not accepting performative acts as a form of, um, of progress uh, and instead really digging in for substantive changes that will um, look the only way we undo this um, is to continue to press for anti-subordinating policies that don't take us back to the baseline of white supremacy. And what's ironic is that it's the performative acts that probably inspire the greatest reaction. Um, and without offering actual redistribution of power uh, across racial lines, right? So that in some ways they are, I mean, that's the danger of liberalism, I, I, I guess, right? Um, or, uh, or liberal legalism um, within um, the, the legal context. Um, uh, Luis, what do you think? Do, do we live in an age of white reaction and retrenchment and, ha and do you see any way out of this, this, this cycle in the near term? Uh, you're muted. You're muted, Luis. What concerns me the most is the way in which this is happening at a time of very significant demographic shift in the population of the United States. And as Latinos continue to grow, as, as Asians continue to grow, as Latinos, Asians make coalitions with progressive whites and with African-Americans, as African-Americans become more and more significant components of statewide electorates, as we saw in Georgia, I see the possibility that, and this is me playing, if you will, psychotherapist a bit, I see the white retrenchment, I see the white racism, I see the calls to white supremacy as being driven by a white insecurity, a sense that whites are not no longer going to be in charge. Mm -hmm. And that insecurity reaches the point of not trusting traditional institutions of government, traditional institutions of government accountability, as we saw on January the 6th, and that as long as those changes continue, those demographic changes continue, if a leader appears who can effectively capture that sense of insecurity as former President Trump was able to do, then I think America is vulnerable mm -hmm. to the possibility that the progress that was made can be limited virtually overnight. Mm 
very quickly, especially when there is majority support on the Supreme Court, majority support in the House or majority support in the Senate to complement the presence of that person perhaps in the White House. I think that's part of the thinking of the impeachment managers to, and, the, and the Democratic majority in the House to try to, to gain a conviction of President Trump and then by simple majority vote, be able to say he can no longer run for office is to at least remove one person from the possibility of being able to access that sense of white insecurity that makes them feel, as, as Professor Wilson and Professor Hinojosa were saying, that makes them feel like this country is no longer theirs and that somehow other people are now in control, other people are now in charge. Mm -hmm. if, uh, thank you, uh, Luis. F Felipe, I wanted to turn back our gaze on, 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 on the left. Um, you know, um, and, and uh, uh, the uh, short dialogue between myself and Erica talked about this dynamic of performativity versus actual redistribution of power. You studied the Young Lords um, who put forth a 13 point program and plan that was a sort of a radical vision of what American society could look like. Do, do, do you think that there is a radical vision that might take us away from uh, the cycles of lukewarm or, you know, kind of uh, short-term reform in exchange for deep retrenchment uh, and backlash? Is, is, the, is, 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 is radical vision one path away from that cycle? You know, I, I, I think what um, the Young Lords presented not only to, um, you know, uh, their neighborhoods and the boroughs of New York City, uh, or the island of, of Puerto Rico, uh, but to the entire country, even to the entire world, is that you have to have these bold visions. You have to have radical visions, uh, you know, in order to bring about, uh, you know, real change. These were folks that were not simply interested in um, doing something simply for the performative aspects, but in trying to really upend the capitalist system. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it, it behooves us more than ever now uh, to really sort of take seriously the calls, uh, if we're looking back historically at uh, the folks that have pushed us to think about, um, you know, critiques, critiquing capitalism, to think about the failures of capitalism, to think about the possibilities that community development bring and the possibilities that um, when you're able to put forth a, a plan uh, for access to healthcare for everyone, uh, when you're able to put forth a plan for, uh, you know, battling and, and, and pushing back against, you know, this hunger uh, epidemic that, that you know, uh, news is reporting something like 30% of school kids, uh, you know, we're in a hunger crisis uh, now and schools are transforming into food pantries and so forth. When you have, you know, these folks, uh, the young lords in, in New York City and Mexican American Youth Organization and Houston and other other places across uh, across the country, uh, hopefully it, it helps us to rethink our vision or our idea of what uh, these radicals um, you know were, were thinking about. I think oftentimes they don't get the credit that they deserve mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, of putting forth this vision. Mm -hmm. um, and it, you know maybe they're thought of as irresponsible, maybe they're thought of as loud or, whatever it might be, but actually they were paving the way forward in terms of um, you know, the failings of capitalism and the possibilities of a socialist society, at least according to what uh, the young lords uh, were arguing. Yeah. And so it, it, more than anything, I think today, uh, you know, and, and, and as a historian, I have to be steeped in hope. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do see that we're at the, you know, the beginning stages. I mean, I got to Texas A&M in 2009 mm -hmm. and I remember a huge Tea Party rally Mm -hmm. um, just that year in response to the election of President Obama. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember being floored by that, never seen anything like that uh, as blatant and as, as clear and as out there uh, mm -hmm. as it was. Um, mm -hmm. And to, to just see it kind of develop and to grow, whether or not Trump is around or not. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so that, that process is going to continue, which means on the other side, in terms yeah. of having this vision, we have to be clear of what it is that we want. And I think looking at the civil rights era, looking at Latinx and, and black uh, radicals uh, who were pragmatic uh, 
came up with breakfast programs, all yeah. of these different things that we're going to need more of as, you know, the economy continues to take hits um, in the wake of, of this pandemic. Uh, but then also in trying to build coalitions, as Luis was mentioning, with progressive whites or with different racial and ethnic minorities, yeah. that's going to be supremely important. And I think the Young Lords and other groups like them give us uh, um, a route to sort of look at that and how to how to do that, even in even in today's uh, highly polarized environment. Thank you, Felipe. Um, um, Erica, um, before we open up to uh, q and I wanted to come back to you. Um, uh, you know, you and I are both um, we're in law. Um, the question of you talked about how law structures uh, white supremacy and racial hierarchy. Um, so are there um, uh, uh, ways in which to challenge, uh, 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 you know, the current um, structures of law, of legal structure, um, in order to uh, redistribute power across uh, race and class lines, to the extent to which Young Lords, Black Panthers, and then their analogous groups in the current context, like the Dream Defenders and Black Lives Matter and um, a, 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 a number of other groups, Mijente, um, are trying to, to be the heirs to, um, you know, the radical groups uh, from that Felipe was just talking about. How, how can the law be altered to, you know, allow for that kind of flourishing um, and potentially larger structural change? Yeah, um, so it's exactly right, right, that the law does shape our expectation norms and property rights. So I think the law actually has a vital role to play here. And one of the first things that um, the law needs to do uh, in order to be effective here is to change our lens when we think about um, equality uh, and inclusiveness, uh, often we will point to anti-discrimination law. We have a civil rights act, we have a voting rights act. Um, but part of the critique of those structures of law is that they're very much wedded to an anti-differentiation, uh, anti-discrimination principle uh, under the guise that as long as we stop uh, treating people we shouldn't treat people differently based on race or ethnicity. And if we stop doing that, uh, then everything will take care of itself. But that's just not true. Uh, as I noted, we've had a long history of race conscious laws that uh, created white supremacy. In order to undo that or level the playing field, so to speak, we need laws that effectuate anti-subordination. Uh, what I mean by anti-subordination is laws that actually push to foment true substantive equality for traditionally marginalized groups. And so it's not politically popular, but to treat everyone the same is not to foment substantive equality. We know that there are substantial wealth gaps. We know that there are substantial gaps in uh, power. So how do we address that from a legal framework perspective? Um, we have to enact some laws that are repertory in nature. Uh, we have to act, enact some laws um, that, uh, take the sting uh, out of our capitalist system. Uh, I'm with Professor Hinoza on the idea that the, a critique of capitalism is very much necessary, uh, but thinking pragmatically, some of the ways that we can combat that are uh, to push for laws that help to, uh, within our um, unfortunate capitalist system, help to uh, make sure that people, particularly traditionally marginalized people, aren't drowning. Um, Things like the minimum wage laws, for example, um, pushing for more jobs programs. We know uh, that of the possibility of creating jobs to help us combat climate change and global warming. All of these things need to be on the table and they need to be on the table under uh, just the ideology or perspective of trying to foster anti-subordination rather than anti-differentiation or anti-discrimination. Yeah, Erica, I, I was just wondering if you could spend a minute just talking about antitrust law because you've written about that most recently and just no one would connect antitrust law necessarily in mainstream um, uh, political dialogue um, to, uh, to, to racial reconstruction. I was just wondering if you'd say a word about that. Right. Um, so in my most recent uh, scholarship, one of the things that I've done is to look at the Sherman Act, uh, which is the law uh, that is used to address monopolization. And so one of the reasons I wanted to do that is because when we talk about uh, inequality, particularly for subordinated groups, we talk about it from the perspective of 
uh, differential treatment, uh, but we don't talk about it from the perspective of whites. Uh, and so one of those things, I talk about it in the context of education, but I think it cuts across many other areas is that the flip side of subordination for marginalized groups um, can be monopolization, white monopolization and hoarding of resources and uh, opportunities. And so I suggest that antitrust law has certain frameworks embedded uh, within the doctrine that might be useful for us to look at in order to understand how to address monopolization. How do we undo monopolies? How do we um, create uh, systems that allow for more robust uh, participation by all? Great, thank you. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. Um, we, we, I wanted to uh, open it up to Q&A. Um, if you have questions, please um, post them um, in, in the Q&A feature. We have a couple of questions. And so I was just, I'm going to pose it to the panel and please feel free to, um, to um, take the lead um, in answering. Um, so uh, one, the first question is, well, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, th there was a question that was responded to, but I'm just going to put it out there in more general terms. There was a question about uh, uh, white supremacist statues on university campuses. Um, there's a question specifically about something, uh, uh, an incident at, at, at Texas A&M. How do you think about this movement to sort of take down Confederate statues and hold universities accountable, particularly public universities? What role does that play in the fight against uh, you know, white retrenchment, white supremacy, um, and, uh, you know, the things that are happening in our current context, the social movements that underlie the insurrection. So I'm happy to take a stab at this because I teach at a public university that's dealing with and has dealt with this very issue. And so if I go back to my prior definition of white supremacy, this idea of that it's a political, economic, and cultural system that uh, perpetuates ideas of white dominance. And so when you think about public institutions uh, putting up statutes or monuments to uh, Confederates who were attempting to maintain a very overt system of white supremacy, it does something, to, it says something about our culture and it uh, perpetuates a particular uh, dynamic in terms of who belongs and who does not belong. Um, so I do think uh, when you have public institutions, uh, there is an obligation um, to, to not um, propagate that history. So the counter argument that we've got, uh, often gotten at my university is, uh, well, you can't undo history and um, you can't rewrite history. But I think it's important that we reframe the debate. This is not about undoing or rewriting history. There are pr plenty of figures in history for whom we don't build uh, statutes or monuments to. It's the valorization of a particular kind of history that feeds into or continues to perpetuate white supremacy. Certainly, uh, we can continue to teach this history. We can put these kind of uh, monuments uh, in museums, but they don't have to be uh, in the public space in ways that continually uh, let uh, or send the message to um, groups, other groups, uh, people of color in particular, uh, that you are not, uh, that this space uh, is not for you or this, that this space is valorizing a particular history uh, that try to subordinate you. I, I completely agree. And I think just to follow up really quick, I, I, um, everything that Professor Wilson just mentioned is something we're going through here at Texas A&M with the Saul Ross statue and some of the protests that happened over uh, the summer last year. The, the other thing that I would just add to that is that if you walk around our campus, at least at Texas A&M here in College Station, there are no uh, other visions of what this history has been all about. There are no other statues to Cesar Chavez or Martin Luther King or other representatives of radical uh, democratic movements um, that are representative of the demographic shifts. Um, the, uh, the student body has worked uh, and faculty and staff uh, as well for over 25 years to get a statue uh, for Matthew Gaines, the Texas Senator, ex-slave Baptist preacher that signed the note that made Texas A&M uh, possible in 1876 uh, during Reconstruction. He was a senator during Reconstruction. So in that, and just having a statue of, of Matthew Gaines took over 25 years to finally get approved and funded and all of that. Um, I think it says something uh, 
uh, about uh, the absence of, of some of those statues when you have a very prominent Confederate one and an unwillingness from an institution to think about different ways of acknowledging our history and uh, some of our other leaders that have made positive changes. I, you know, there's another uh, question that just popped up with regard to the sort of personnel that administer the university, and you could extend that to faculty and the, the kinds of underrepresentation that um, continues to be extended um, in, in the current context. Uh, and that is, are universities uh, home part of the retrenchment, or are they part of um, something else? Are they part of some uh, radical rethinking of the way things are and um, the potential of extending um, uh, radical uh, democratic uh, uh, enfranchisement to the broadest possible uh, groups of people? Um, but I, I wanted to shift. There's kind of two related questions about, specifically about Hispanic and African-American male support for Trump, and then a broader question about the way in which white supremacy um, uses conservative uh, people of color um, uh, often as tokens um, in order to rebut um, you know, accusations of, uh, of white supremacy and white re retrenchment. I was wondering if um, any of you would like to comment on, on, on this very real dynamic uh, on, on the right and, um, and you know, within white supremacist movements. Um, I'll take a stab at it. Mm -hmm. Certainly it's the case that there have always been some African Americans and even more Latinos who have been sympathetic to uh, conservative views and Republican views. Part of that may be driven by um, concerns related to reproductive rights. Uh, part of that may be related to conservatism, uh, related to uh, immigration. But what we know for sure is that there are patterns out there and those patterns have African-Americans in general, in general, not everywhere, in general, supporting more conservative candidates at 5% maybe, maybe 10% in some instances. For Latinos, it's closer to 25%. In fact, if you look back to as long as we've had data on Latinos and voting in presidential elections, at least according to the measures used, and there's a lot of controversy within political science as to whether appropriate sampling techniques were used and measures and so forth. But if you take the data as at its face value, about 28.4% of Latinos have supported any Republican who has run for president of the United States. So you have to understand any increase or decrease in light of what these averages are. Um, it's not related, as best we can tell from the data, to socioeconomic status. It seems to be related more to some components of ideology, and it's not equitably distributed across the country. For Latinos, of course, we know that people of Cuban origin have a different uh, traditional distribution of um, Democrat and Republican support, more Republican than any other group. But even among the Latino Democratic supporters, there's higher support in New York and New Jersey than there is in Texas and California. So the, the idea that there's diversity is important to understand. But the, the overall pattern is one of a two to one, three to one higher level of support for Democrats consistently. And for African-Americans, it's much more high than that. So when people say increase, they have to understand and explain how much of an increase, mm. whether or not that increase is consistent over time. For mm. Latinos, you have to start at that base. I use 25% as mm. a base Republican support. For mm. African Americans, I use a 5% to 10% base mm. of support and see if it goes up and down from that. Um. I just that's I would add one more thing to that that I think is important uh, exactly right is that there's also a gender component to it there was a, a question asked particularly about African American uh, and Latinx men and so I think we've talked about white supremacy but we haven't talked about patriarchy and the way that some patriarchal ideology espoused by conservatism, Trumpism in, in particular, is more likely to appeal uh, to, uh, to the male demographic uh, across race. So I think in this conversation, we also have to uh, not neglect the work of talking about uh, what it is that patriarchy does in terms of pressing a certain uh, notion of 
relation, gender relationships and how that might influence um, what is happening in terms of uh, support for various candidates. But there may be ways in which Trump is appealing to a kind of patriarchal element across race lines, right? Um, uh, and, the, and, and so, yeah, so uh, point very well taken, Erica. The, the idea of intersectionality, Kim Crenshaw's conception of intersectionality has to be integrated into our understanding um, as opposed to just taking a unitary race lens, uh, which really will not give us all the answers that we need in order to um, move forward. Um, I, I wanted to, there was a question that was asked by um, one of the registrants um, about um, the tension between free speech and racial incitement. Um, and, uh, and I think this goes also to social media, most likely as well, right? The, I, the way in which uh, white supremacy is taking form in the current context is at least partly dependent on speech that's being disseminated through social media. And so how, how, do you, how do you think about the tension between free speech rights and racial incitement? Um, is this just something that we have to live with? Um, the fact that there will be um, uh, white supremacist speech in our, in, in our, on our computer screens in front of us, our, in front of our children, um, and kind of being you know, uh, uh, extended and radiated uh, across generations. I'm not a legal scholar, so I'll let the, the legal folks talk about First Amendment rights, but I will say that it's important to make a distinction between free speech and lying. And when the facts demonstrate that what you're saying is completely untrue, not a matter of opinion, mm -hmm. but when your description of a circumstance, when your description of data, when your description of perhaps an electoral process that happened recently is is objectively from any perspective wrong, as demonstrated time and time and time again, I think that might be a circumstance where a restriction on freedom of speech is appropriate because what you're not doing is expressing your opinion, what you're doing is misleading, misleading the public. And I understand this is a very complex area and a complex issue, but I do see a fundamental difference between the two. And I think social media companies have to take more responsibility for limiting one, the misleading and two, limiting hate. Now this has happened all around the world when social media has been used to attack people of different religions, of different ethnic origins in Asia and Africa and other places. So this is not just a US phenomenon. It's something that I think social media companies have a responsibility to help us think through. I mean, this might be an instance in which um, monopoly law can be used in, in its original conception, uh, mm -hmm. potentially, for the state to regulate. Um, okay, I, I uh, thank you so much to the three of you for this great discussion. I'm going to turn it up back to, to Luz. And thank you, Professor Eshar, for all your uh, help in bringing this conversation forward. Uh, and thank, thank you to all of you who joined us today. If you'd like to join us again, we'll be back in two weeks. Uh, the recording, some folks have asked about the recording of this particular webinar and it will be up probably in about a week and a half in the same uh, same place where you registered, which is tamulawanswers.info. So thank you again for the panelists, for all your insights and for, um, and for your leadership in the conversation, Samir. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.